Hi everybody, this is Charlie Green. Welcome to the webcast on understanding the trust equation and 12 trust tips. Quick little bit about who I am and what we're doing here and we'll get right into it. I'm gonna talk in a short period of time to maximize your return on at least time investment. Didn't cost you a lot, but it'll cost you in time. I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, I'm founder and CEO of Trusted Advisor Associates. We've been in business for 15 years helping um, uh, professional service firms and more broadly complex B2B businesses uh, to develop professional relationships. We do workshops, custom programs, we have an enterprise app, three books that you see right here. That's enough of the advertising. Very quickly, uh, moving right along. Um, housekeeping here, we've muted everyone. Use chat to send me questions and I'll leave some time at the end for questions. A uh, quick bit about me, I'm a CEO of Trusted Advisor Associates, as I said. I grew up in Nebraska, or my family's all from there. Um, drove a taxi part-time while going to college in New York City. Went to Harvard Business School, joined uh, the Mac Group and later Gemini Consulting, and spent 20 years in the business of general management consulting. And then I spent almost 20 years now <clears throat> as head of Trusted Advisor Associates. So that's enough about me. Many of you already know about the trust equation. That's why you're here. Uh, very briefly, here's what it looks like. Trustworthiness, which is what this is, is a function of credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by self-orientation. Now, let me get some context on that to begin with. Oh, well, sorry, we'll also hit 12 trust tips. Keep an eye out for them as they come along. But let me get some context. Uh, the trust equation, as I said, has to do with trustworthiness. Trust itself is a composite of two things. There is trustworthiness, which we'll talk about, but there's also trusting. And the combination of those two yields what we call trust. Um, that may sound simple, but it's uh, easy to get confused in it. The trustworthiness part of it is what we're gonna focus on today. That's what the trust equation talks about, but I don't want you to forget, there's also the whole issue of risk-taking and trusting, which really kicks off a trust relationship to begin with. So anyway, the trust equation we're gonna talk about has to do with trustworthiness. So let's jump into it. Uh, those four factors, credibility, largely has to do with a sense of words. It's what we say. So uh, they have to do with truthfulness, credentials. In a sentence, you might hear us say something like, I can trust what she says about the following subject. And what do we mean by that? We mean things like um, the logic makes sense, uh, there's good supporting data. I recognize the degree hanging on the wall from that famous institution. Uh, it hangs together. I've heard other things like this. Uh, that, that's the sort of thing that we tend to mean. Reliability, by contrast, has to do with actions. And here, in a sentence, we're more likely to say something like, I can trust him too. I can trust my good buddy to always have my back. I can trust the FedEx delivery guy to always show up on time. Uh, I can trust him too. Now, those two tend to be kind of the, the probably the first things that come to most people's minds. The third one, an unusual factor, intimacy. This has to do with a sense of personal security. You think of discretion, you think of empathy. In a sentence, we might say something like, I can trust her with this information. Meaning, if I share this with her, she'll know whether to laugh or not. And she'll know who to pass it along to. And if she does pass it along to someone, she'll know just how to deal with it. She'll be careful to be concerned about my feelings. She'll handle it in just the right way. I think I can trust her with this information. Now remember, those three factors are in the numerator, credible, reliable, intimacy, CRI. The denominator factor, S, which stands for self-orientation, is rather different. This one has to do with a sense of focus, uh, like who you're paying attention to. And here we get an interesting word, uh, caring. I can trust that he cares about. And the next words are critical because if, you, if the person tends to care about themselves, that's a big no-no. Now it happens that self-orientation, remember the way that works in the equation, a higher number for self-orientation drives down the value of T, trustworthiness. More self-orientation, less trustworthiness. There are two flavors of self-orientation that come into play here. The first one's fairly obvious and it doesn't really need to concern most of it. So that's simply selfishness, right? Has to do with motives. If the person's in it for themselves, you know, the classic image we have of the used car dealer, uh, that's not hard to spot, actually. It may be, you know, really negative, but it's not that hard to, to see. The trickier one, the more relevant uh, aspect of high self-orientation that we need to worry about is not so much selfishness, it is self-obsession, worrying all the time 
How are they going to like me? Am I going to get the sale? Does my boss care about me? Is she going to say yes? Is, uh, is this person going to say no? What are they thinking about me? How am I looking all the time? Self-obsession. That one happens to be, you know, the, an occupational hazard for nearly everybody in consultative or advisory roles, which I think most of you listening to this probably fit into that. And that's, that's a real big deal. So now we can look at these four components, C, R, I, and S, and I suggest to you the first two we might broadly call rational. Uh, those are the two that uh, you can do metrics on, you can measure, you can define, you can translate fairly easily into behaviors. The other two, they're not so much irrational, I call them more emotional. Those are the two, the intimacy and the low self-orientation. Those are a lot harder to measure. And uh, in, in some ways, you know, you can translate them into behavior, but you can't do the behavior in a way that you can do riding a bicycle, hitting a golf ball, practicing French. They're a lot more, you know, intuitive, uh, the soft skills, if you will. So with that, <clears throat> now it turns out that we've done some uh, research. We've actually translated this into a thing called the TQ or trust quotient, which is a self-assessment version of the trust equation. So we actually have data. And it turns out that the strongest driver of the four, and I mean that literally here, we've done a multiple regression analysis on the data. It turns out that the strongest driver was not what we originally thought when we wrote the book, self-orientation. That's why we put it in the denominator. No, it turns out that the strongest driver turns out to be intimacy. Now, that is a really interesting finding for most of us on this call. Again, most people who go into the kind of consultative profession work that we, that we deal with, that's not our strongest suit. And uh, the good news is, well, the bad news is, you know, most of us are not good at it. The good news is it's not that hard to learn. It's, uh, I suggest it's a lot easier to uh, train an accountant, for example, in getting better at interpersonal skills than it is to train a social worker in accounting, for example. Uh, now, let's go through these one at a time here. Let's talk about credibility first. And remember, credibility, it isn't just about credentials. Uh, clients, uh, credentials just say how smart you are, but clients want to know that you're smart for them. What does it mean for them? So this isn't just the purely rational cognitive degrees on the wall stuff. So tip number one, have a point of view. People don't care that you got a degree from somewhere, how smart you are, how brilliant your insights are. They want to know what it means for them. And the way that you do that, the way you translate, instead of talking about how bright you are and how many degrees you have and what your methodology is, Tell them, here's what it means for you. Here's what I think it means for you. Let me do the translation. Make it relevant for them. So that's one point. Another one is demonstrate your expertise. Don't talk about it. Um, you know, it's kind of like if you think of the metaphor, if, you get a, if you're going in for a job interview, the reason you got the job interview was your resume was attractive. Well, that's the credentials. That got you in the door. But what if in that interview, you were to suddenly start talking about reading off all the stuff in, in your resume. Boring. And that's why, you, that's why you're there. Don't do that. And yet, I'll bet how many of us, you know, sitting out there have gone into a sales pitch of some kind. And what do we start by doing on the PowerPoint? Let me tell you about ourselves. Let me tell you about our great company, all the things we've done. Don't do that. Leave those off on the side. And don't worry about looking smart. You will be seen to be smart if in your uh, conversations, uh, your expertise comes out. You don't have to push it. All you have to do is ask an occasional smart question or nod knowingly in the right way when you actually know something. It does come through and it's a, a lot better than sort of tooting your own horn. Now, credibility also has to do not just with smarts, but also with trust and transparency. It's about whether people can believe what you have to say. So here's, a, here's an interesting recommendation. When you don't know something, say, I don't know. Uh, that is immediately believable, ironically. It's one of the most uh, trust-creating things you can say is, I don't know. Like, who's going to doubt you on that one, right? Um, and, and by the way, don't be in a rush to say, I don't know, but I can get the answer for you. Yeah, 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 we know. Anybody can do a Google search. The point is not that you can get the answer. The point is, are you willing in that moment, in that seat, in that hot spot to say, that one I don't know. You know, what, what shall we do with that? It's rarely a showstopper, but the, uh, you know, whatever it is that they asked you, what they're really finding out is do you have the courage to, you know, articulate what the limits of your knowledge are. So there's a few thoughts and a few tips around credibility. 
Let's talk about reliability. This one, again, has to do with actions. Um, and um, uh, part of it has to do with aligning expectations. Reliability, people want to feel that they know you in the sense that there's no surprises. They get where you're coming from. They get the kind of way you think about things. They want to know the road that you're leading them to, and they want to feel familiar with that. So here's a tip, set agendas for meetings. That, that one may sound surprising. It's very basic. All of us have done this, but I'll bet you a few of us do it all the time. And it's something you, you should do almost every single time, whether it's a 15 minute phone call, uh, an all day meeting, you know, a, a, a one hour conference call, doesn't matter. At the beginning, at the outset, say, listen, I thought I'd take a minute and just outline what I thought we should accomplish here today. Does this make sense? Does this work for you? The point of doing that is, is first of all, you get everybody's buy-in, uh, assuming they all buy in. If they don't buy in and they want to add something, that's even better. You know, let me add this to the agenda. I want to make sure we talk about this. Good. Let's add that to the agenda. But the point is uh, that pays off because if the conversation begins to go off track, you have now earned the right to say, hey, wait a minute, we, we talked about we were going to cover this. Do we want to change and spend more time going over here or do we want to come back to the main agenda? You become a group, a group of we, not just me, trying to get through some point. You enlist everybody on your side. That's a tremendous tool for, for reliability and a real simple one to do. Here's another one. Be unbelievably responsive. Now, I know that in this day and age, there are things. You, sometimes you're traveling. Sometimes you're sitting on a webinar like this one, uh, sort of hopefully paying attention although you're probably multitasking too. But whenever you get off it, whenever you have some time, whatever it is, get on those emails and calls immediately, right away. It's amazing how powerful responsiveness is, particularly in this day and age of automated uh, bots and responses and so forth. Uh, there's some research from the inside sales uh, arena that suggests the difference between answering a call within half an hour and answering it within five minutes is several hundreds of percentage increase in ineffective sales. People are blown away by it and it's uh, it's not that hard to do. Another one, and this is this is controversial. You've all heard the phrase uh, under promise and over perform and we should exceed expectations. Well, challenge that. Think about it. If you're always exceeding expectations, then one of two, at least one of two things is happening. You are telling people something knowingly other than what you're going to do. There's another word for that. It's called lying. And then you're exceeding what you told them you would do. That is also lying by another word. And people catch on. If you always under promise and over deliver, they begin to adjust their expectations and they know that you're sandbagging it all the time. So don't do that. Instead, become known for saying what you're gonna do and then doing exactly what you said you were gonna do. That's reliability. Now, the biggest factor, the most powerful one, as I suggested, is intimacy. And, and one that uh, most people in advisory professions tend not to be that great at because we tend to be much more focused on subject matter mastery. But you know, all the more reason to talk about this one. Uh, secure and transparent. Uh, that has a lot to do with intimacy. Willingness to take the lead, willingness to be open. What do I mean by that? One of them is this notion of bring a risky gift. And let me give you a metaphor first and then translate it. The metaphor is you get invited out to dinner, you know, you and your partner get to invited to dinner with some couple that you know from, you know, roughly work related. And it's kind of a big deal. You, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a step up in the relationship and, and maybe you're the only ones going there. Maybe there are a few others, whatever. What do you do on the way to dinner? Well, you, you stop at the liquor store and you buy a nice bottle of wine, right? Um, fine, you get, that's kind of, you're supposed to do that. You get thank you uh, for having done it. But what if you were to take that an extra step? What if you were saying, you know, I think they were in Italy for vacation last summer, and I think they went to the Piemonte region in Northern Italy. What if we got them a really nice bottle of red from, from the Piemonte region and spend a little extra? And instead of spending, you know, $20, you spend 35 or 40 or something, and, and you go there. Well, number one, probably that will really impress them um, because, because you're thoughtful, because you went the extra mile. But here's the point. You could be wrong. It could be that they're alcoholics, you know, and they're, they're, they don't buy wine. Or maybe you got it wrong and they went to Spain instead of Italy. But here's the real point. You get credit anyway. 
even if they're alcoholics, they will almost always say, thank you so much. We don't drink, but we're going to save that for our next guest. Thank you so much. Or maybe you'd like it now. And if it was Spain, that's okay too, because you thought about it. You showed the effort. Not only did you show the effort, you were willing to take a little bit of a risk and go out there. That is a great trust creator, the willingness to show a risk. Now, how does that little metaphor translate into business? It means when you start interacting with a client, don't make everything that you say, you know, guaranteed, bulletproof, never say anything wrong. No, be willing to take a risk. Offer a gift of your insight, your background, your capabilities, and push the limits a little bit. That first point of have a point of view, this one adds to it. Have a point of view that's a little bit risky, a little bit out there. You could be wrong because you get credit for being willing to take that extra risk. Another aspect of and this is also kind of controversial uh, for intimacy, write your next proposal with your client. The usual way that we write proposals these days is you, you go back and forth. It used to be FedEx, you'd send a letter, now it's email. Uh, you respond to the RFP. It's all very impersonal, but more importantly, it's done at a distance. What if, you know, major concept change here, what if you were to call up the client and say, listen, let's write that proposal together. How about if I come over or we get on a hangout or something and we literally, literally write the proposal document together. We'll solve all the issues, you know, together. We'll address all the concerns. We'll get all the pricing discussed. Everything you want to know, we'll get it in a shared document. Now I get it. It's a proposal. There's no guarantee that we'll win. Uh, I'm not trying to put one over on you, but what we will have is the best proposal possible that we can produce for you if we do it that way. Now, number one, you get credit for proposing such a radical idea. Number two, they might possibly object to it and say, well, I don't know if it's appropriate, in which case you say, fine, if it's not, I understand, but I want you to know the offer's there. Or maybe they will say, gee, if we did it for you, we'd have to do it for everyone, in which case you say, that's a great idea. You'll get more free consulting out of doing it for everyone. I think you should do that. And you know what? You get credit for being the one that brought it up in the first place. It sounds risky. It's absolutely not. It's a brilliant idea, actually, and it works amazingly well, even if they don't accept it. Let's see. Uh, also, intimacy, uh, secure, transparent, able to discuss all things. And remember, in, in business, uh, we like to think that things are are impersonal and big and, and there's professionalism and all that stuff. The person you're sitting in front of, the person you're looking at at the other end of the webcast, the person on the other end of the phone, they're a human being just like you. And, and we tend to forget that. We tend to think it's unprofessional. We tend to walk away from it. People are people. They don't change the minute they walk into the office door, the minute they get on the, on the call. They're still human beings. And it's important for us to recognize that. In fact, that's the essential difference that makes trusted advisors from merely great subject matter experts. Um, so here's a single best way probably to do this. Find out a way to comment either on your feelings and or on their feelings. Some of you have, are familiar with the, um, the literature on, on uh, uh, emotional intelligence. For those of you that aren't, I'll break it down for you real simple. There are four components. Number one, uh, the ability to notice your own feelings. Number two, the ability to articulate your own feelings. Number three, the ability to notice the feelings of others in them. And number four, the ability to articulate those feelings of others. Put those four together and, and find opportunities for you to be able to say, you, you look like a, a little perplexed on that one. Should I back up? Should we stop for a minute? Or, uh, you know, I got to tell you, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about this situation today and, and explain why. The willingness to be vulnerable. There's been a lot written about vulnerability and it very much applies in the intimacy part of the trust equation. That's, this is how you do it. So there's a bet on intimacy. And now let's go to the denominator in the trust equation, self-orientation, the one that goes the other way. Uh, part of it is being able to raise issues, to speak to the elephant in the room and, and to serve the larger need. And the biggest problem there is just our own fears, getting over our obsession with self, our own self-fear and so forth. Uh, one, of the, one tip is simply practice thinking out loud. And I mean that very simply and literally. Just let me think out loud with you. Uh, you could literally use those words. Let me just think out loud with you for a minute. What that does is kind of take a meta step back and say, hey, look, I'm just going to free form here. This could be wrong. I get it. I'm asking you to participate in kind of working out in real time with me. That's an act of low self-orientation because it says, I'm not going to operate out of fear here. I'm just going to share some things. 
and invites them into the sharing. It works, thinking out loud. Um, another thoughts around low self-orientation. Remember, th this is the single biggest problem that we run into in all of our workshops. The notion that our job as consultative professionals, advisory people, is to solve the problem and to be the first one to get there. Uh, and, and it's just not the case. Over and over and over again, there's research in sales, there's research in counseling, there's research in hostage negotiation. All of them say the same thing. It's this rush to be in a hurry to get the answer that actually shuts things down. It's paradoxical. We don't want to be told the answer until we have finished telling you what the problem is. Now, you as the expert, you probably know what the problem is. You're probably correct. You've seen it a hundred times, but that's not what the other person wants to hear. They'd like to know that you've done this a hundred times. That's why they came to see you, but they don't want your answer to be, yeah, I've seen this a hundred times. You're just like everybody else. I got the answer already. Stop wasting my time. No, what they want to hear is you paying utter, rapt, complete attention so that you can emotionally connect with them and how they feel about this particular issue. And having done that, having explained it to you and feeling that you actually get where they're coming from, at that point, they're willing to say, now, talk to me, what, what should I do? And at that point, you've been invited to give advice, give the answer, and they're welcome to it, okay? So, but this, this problem is, is uh, it is seriously the biggest problem we run into in all our workshops, answering the problem too soon. Paradoxically, the best way to be heard is first to hear them. So a couple of practical tips on that one. Don't jump to problem solving. Just examine your conversations clinically and, and resist the temptation to drive ahead and, uh, and instead spend a lot of time on listening. Now, some people say, well, how do I know when I'm done listening? They will tell you. They'll say, enough already. I got nothing more to tell you. You got all the data. What should I do? That's an invitation. Until you hear something like that, don't assume that you're done listening. And my final one, of course, is shut up and listen. S-U-A-L. Uh, the power of listening is extraordinary. And let me just articulate. You hear a lot about listening for, for data uh, to, to prove or disprove hypotheses. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. Nor am I even talking about active listening, where you engage and paraphrase and all that. What I'm talking about is listening with the only purpose, the only intent being to make sure that the other person feels heard. Listening so that they feel heard. How do you, you know, how do you metricize that? How do you know? I don't know. You will know in your bones. Human beings are highly evolved uh, entities, and all of you are too. We kind of know when people are, are feeling heard and understood. They show it on the body language. They react. You can hear it in their voice. Just shut up and listen. Best, best single advice I can give. So again, let me put this trust in context here and uh, remind you we're talking about trustworthiness and trusting, the combination of the two of which results in, in trust. Now, uh, I went through this kind of quickly. Uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me jump to some uh, answers uh, or, or questions rather coming up from people here. Good, bunch of questions. Uh, here's one. Where does consistency fit in the trust equation? I imagine it fits in reliability. Um, yes, it does fit in reliability uh, in, in exactly the way you would think. Uh, consistent leads to uh, met expectations, but it also shows up at a, at a broader level. There's a sense of consistency across all four components. And this is true statistically, we found. Uh, people who have a lower standard deviation between the four answers tend to score higher than those who have a higher standard deviation between the four answers. In other words, if somebody is sort of, uh, you know, medium high on credibility, reliability, intimacy, but terrible on self-orientation, not only do we think they're terrible on self-orientation, we think, huh, that's kind of inconsistent. That's a weird mix. Same thing is true if somebody's off scale on, on any of the other, any other three factors, all four of them. Uh, they have different sort of pathologies, if you will. Somebody who's low on credibility, but great on everything else, they're a windbag. Somebody who's low on reliability, but high on the others, they're flaky. Somebody who is low on intimacy, but high on the others, they're a nerd. And somebody who's bad on self-orientation and high on the others, they're devious. We can't, we can't trust them in that sense. So that's the other way in which consistency has to, uh, uh, to show up. Let's see, how should we use the information you have shared here? Is it okay to share your trust equation with people in a classroom setting and credit you as the source? Uh, yes, it is. 
Uh, we try not to worry too much about intellectual property and so forth. Spell our name correctly, spell my name correctly, give us credit, but beyond that, sure. I'd much rather view that as, as well-intended marketing and share the gospel than to get lost in, in uh, uh, rights and quibbles over who owns intellectual property. So, yes. Uh, here's one. Do you have a questionnaire that allows us to evaluate ourselves or our business relationships in this dimension? Absolutely, thank you for asking. I mentioned earlier the TQ, Trust Quotient. It is a self-assessment uh, exercise based on the trust equation that we've just started, uh, that we just talked about. It dawned on me about eight years ago that this would actually make a really good self-assessment. And we started putting it up online and sure enough, 70,000 people have come and taken it, uh, which is where we get some of the data that I mentioned about intimacy being uh, the most powerful factor that comes from, from analyzing the data. Uh, and you can find that, go to our website, trustedadvisor.com. And if you look in the upper right hand corner, uh, you'll see, uh, you can click on a thing and you can take the TQ. There's a free version of it. You get a quick answer, two pages of input. And if you want to give us 30 bucks, we'll give you 20 pages of detailed output and analysis. It's not a bad deal, by the way. Uh, so yes, there is a self-assessment. Um, let's see, uh, is that a relationship by relationship evaluation or is it just an individual self-evaluation? It's an individual self-evaluation for one person, you, and how you think other people uh, perceive you. So it's about, it's about individual. My, my contention is that most trust is personal. The most powerful form of trust is personal. We don't trust institutions nearly with the strength that we trust other people. And furthermore, trust-based institutions are institutions in which people behave in trusting and trustworthy ways with each other. Uh, I trust Amazon to deliver books on time. I'm not gonna trust them to babysit my grandson. It's a different kind of thing. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, have you seen notable differences when implementing the trust equation between generations like Gen X and millennials? Or is it pretty general across the board? Great question. I wish I knew the answer to that. We have not uh, uh, attempted to put too many um, demographics into the questions. In fact, we've scaled back on them because people get touchy. So I can't tell you that one. I wish I did know the answer. I'm tempted to speculate, but now nah, I probably better not. I, I, I suspect there are differences and it would be interesting to see. Great question. I'm, if you've got any ideas on how I can do that, uh, let me know. Uh, oh, here's a great one. It would be nice to set up a 360 questionnaire so that people can ask their clients to comment on their advisors and salespeople. Peter, thank you for asking that question. There is exactly such a product. We call it the TQ360. It's been up and running for several years. It's a growth product for us. It does exactly what you said. It, it allows you to pick a number of people, whether clients, coworkers, whatever, and anonymously have them answer the same questions that you answer about yourself. So it's tremendously valuable. Our clients love it. It lets you answer the question, well, I think I'm high in credibility and low on self-orientation, but you know, what do they think? Um, and it gives you the answer to that question. Uh, and by the way, in general, just anecdotally, most of us are fairly on point about, uh, about those answers. We tend, not, we tend to be on average a little higher or a little lower than others, but we tend to be fairly spot on with respect to our relative strengths and weaknesses across the particular uh, uh, components. Uh, so, great question. And yes, I encourage you to look into that. Uh, let's see. Um, when you think about corporate culture, what is the best way to infuse intimacy and low self-orientation into the system? Well, I let me reiterate what I said a moment ago. Um, uh, unlike processes or or even certain cultural values like, uh, I'm not sure what, but you can't very well create trust in an organization through metrics or through incentives. Some of this, or even behaviors, some of this has to come from within. And of course, what's within manifests itself in certain behaviors. But what all that says, uh, trust is very much a culture thing. And there are two unique things about it. Number one, uh, role modeling is really critical. Uh, if the CEO or the leader of an organization or a team 
says, well, you all ought to work on enhancing your credentials, you don't necessarily fault them if they don't do that great themselves. Sometimes leaders are humble, you know, they point to other people, they leverage other people. We don't view that as a sin. But if somebody says, you should all be really trustworthy, and they don't do it themselves, that's a hypocrite. And we immediately reject it. So when it comes to trust, I think the value of role modeling is, is outsized. And the second point I make about it is, is because this is social and has to do with interactions, what you want to do is stimulate behavior of trusting and being trustworthy with each other. Uh, we could, I mean, there are various tools that we have, there's some videos, et cetera, et cetera. But the single best thing I think any organization can do is talk about it. Have periodic discussions amongst yourselves about what you're doing, what's working, what's not. Don't worry about measurements so much. Don't worry about top-down. Generate conversations. That can be a top-down initiative, but, it, but the discussions have to happen across the organization. Let's see. Um, for self-orientation, how would you address the issue of perception versus someone's internal intentions? Um, I, I think that is a uh, uh, kind of an, an insoluble dilemma. It's, it's a philosophic dilemma, you know, part, part psychology, part metaphysics. How can you actually tell what is going on in somebody else's head? Well, you can't. I mean, on some an ultimate level, you can't. You have no clue. And the philosophers will argue whether, whether I see the same color green that you see. Maybe you see blue when I call it yellow. And who knows? You know, you can't prove it one way or the other. But I think we can pretty well. Uh, in, the, in the real practical world, uh, human beings have evolved uh, mechanisms over eons. We are finely developed tools of evolution to sense what's going on with our fellow kindred human beings. And uh, we, we tend to pretend that's not true in this day of Google and artificial intelligence and so forth. But the fact is, every one of you has gut feelings and instinctive reactions. And 99 times out of 100, you're right. We stifle it, you know, because we think we need data or something. But you know what? Listen to your gut uh, more often than, uh, than, we, than we tend to do. So that, that's my only comment on that one. Let's see. Did we have anything else here? Um... Uh, ba, 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 ba. I think that's that's about it. We've we've touched on all of them. All right. Listen again. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking time uh, with me today. Um, let me just mention, and I mean this sincerely. If you have any questions or comments or want to continue the dialogue, please reach out to me. I'm serious about that. My email is cgreen at trustedadvisor.com. Go to the website, uh, give me a phone call, whatever. I appreciate the chance to talk about this stuff. It's my life's work. I think it's critical and important, and I appreciate the interest that all of you have shown for dialing in here today. Okay, ciao. Thank you.